so Abner Coimbrae got his uh, start at NASA as an intern for a year, um, where he learned about how they go about creating software that uh, launches satellites into space. Um, he then went on to found the Handmade Network, which is a, a large community, a lot of uh, game dev focus, and they put on this event called Handmade Seattle every year in, uh, in Seattle in November. Um, I've, I've mentioned it a couple times here before. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's all about uh, understanding machines from the ground up um, and being able to usually make pretty cool games, really cool experiences. Um, I remember there was like one demo, someone had kind of like a, a top-down RPG, almost like RuneScape-like, but you were programming uh, like little, little mobs to help you fight. It was, but it was like, it, it was still like GUI programming. It was very, very cool. Um, and then like another one where someone had, um, you're playing this player where they had like laser vision. So in order to be able to see the map, you had to project onto the walls within like this facility you're going around. Um, but you know, guess what? There's like something lurking in the in the in the dark uh, out, the, out to get you. Uh, so there's like a lot of like really cool projects like that. Um, and then Abner also worked on uh, I believe Jai with with Jonathan Blow for a little while. Worked on um, uh, Mystery Make, which is uh, I think this island-based puzzle game. Um, but since then, he's gone like full independent as an event organizer. And it used to be called Handmade Seattle, but he had to change the name to Handmade Cities because they couldn't just keep it in one location. They had to branch out to Boston, which is happening in uh, August 10th, roughly. Um, with that event, too, it's kind of cool. It's not, it's, uh, I would say this format is very similar to Handmade Seattle, but in the Boston event, what they're doing is a heavy uh, workshop focus. So there's uh, a bunch of notable figures within the handmade community. Uh, you, you get to have like hands-on, like uh, let's debug, uh, I think one of them was uh, Nintendo GameCube or, or like yeah. they would like do a bunch of uh, reverse engineering of like older consoles from Nintendo, which is pretty sweet. Um, so I, I, I really uh, appreciate Abner. He, he really cares about how you build your software, but most importantly, kind of like the why and like the actual like ethics behind that. Um, and uh, I, because he, you know, he puts all, all this work into organizing events, um, I thought it would be really great to actually give him some time to like relax a bit and talk about some of the stuff he does. Um, so everyone put it, put it together for you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. It's fine, solid, awesome. So my name is Abner Coimbre. You can just call me Abner, obviously. And I am really excited for the gracious invite that Matt did uh, for me to be here and be a speaker to talk about a project called Terminal Click, which has been, for the past few years, kind of like on and off kind of hobby thing, but then I care about it a lot. And it has been mostly done in secret. So this is a great opportunity to talk about all of the things of this project. Um, and Matt did encourage me to talk a little bit about what I do day to day. And yes, I organize conferences. And Handmade, I do believe, has overlap with software you can love right here. So we have uh, very similar vibes and energy. So it's no surprise that I am here with you and like, having a good time. And um, Handmade tends to have an interesting angle on we care about diving deeper into how computers actually work. Right? So very often, Programmers, none of you here, I'm sure, but uh, there are programmers who just do it for the paycheck, and I get it, not a problem, but then when they're programming, they're just, I'm sorry to say it this way, but like they're stitching together black boxes, or they're just calling magic functions without understanding like, what the cost is when you're architecting you know, you know, the machine stuff that you saw in the previous talk, right? all of this, you don't really know what's going on kind of thing. But uh, handmade is for people who have like a natural affinity for like really digging deeper into how things work, just because you're curious. Like you wanna know about the craft and you wanna build interesting software and the more you know about how software works, actually, and how they run on machines, actually, then you tend to craft better software, hopefully. That's the idea, right? And we're not perfect. It doesn't mean that uh, hopefully we don't give off an air of elitism or anything like that, right? We're always here to learn. But the curiosity aspect of it is like super important. And I think it goes hand in hand with software you can love because 
Um, even if I'm building like the perfect quality piece of software, like this pristine Faberge egg, <laughs> right? if I give it to a user and the user's like, I don't understand it, or like the user interface is clunky, or like I don't know what you want me to do with this, like what problem did it solve? I do think that software you can love, like when it meshes with Handmade in that way, kind of like completes the whole picture, actually. Um, so that's what I do for a, a, a living, is running these conferences. So the same way Matt's running software you can love, I run Handmade Seattle and now Handmade Boston this year. Uh, but I have been a programmer, as Matt was saying, for a long time. It is nice to go back, step out of the social butterfly stuff and organizing stuff and talk about software. So here we are. Um, um, you can see that one of my favorite things is playing Majora's Mask. I have a little jacket there of Majora's Mask, if you didn't notice. Um, and I live and work just to be able to drink chocolate wine. Um, <laughs> it's the simple things in life. You know, life is too modern, life is too complex and complicated. I try to make a living and do all this stuff just so I can sit down with a glass of chocolate wine at the end of the day. Um, I'm not even kidding, that's true, right? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> terminal click, here we go, software. Uh, software that hopefully you, you, you love. So terminal click, terminal emulator is what I'm building. So I'm a little curious how many of you here, since you're programmers just like me, uh, tend to use a terminal for their job like almost daily? I want to know. Oh, almost unanimous. That's, that's incredible. So it's the same thing with me, right? So for all of my career, I just started my 30s, right? So all of my 20s has been on a terminal. Because when I, was very, when I struck gold with a great opportunity at NASA, obviously old terminals. And we're talking like the old consoles, they still use those old VGA you know, connections. So uh, that's what I did for years. And then when I worked for my next company, you know, Tecla, Jai, Jonathan Blow, I was also in the terminal a lot. And then for Mist, on the terminal actually a lot. Um, so I got to think about, do I love this piece of software? Um, I don't think so, actually. Like, uh, the experience of it seems clunky. Uh, the text interaction, like, you know, when you, you type in some text, you get back some text. As far as I know, that's, that's what a terminal does. Right? You type in some text, you get back some text. The text is dead. <laughs> There's no interactivity with that text. And if you want to do something with that text, then you have to go out of your way outside the terminal, call into these command line programs in order to do something interesting with the text. And it gets complicated because you have to interact with the shell and like, these weird symbols of like redirection and pipes. And it's like, I don't love this. I don't appreciate this. Uh, it's been many years. Like, why hasn't anybody improved on terminals at all? And am I cowboy and silly enough to maybe see if I can do something different? Um, so I'll give you a sneak peek on some of the experiments I've been doing out of this frustration, right? So um, the, let's see if I can, can you guys see that? Yep. So that's terminal click, and it looks like any other terminal. And I just was trying to run make, and I had an error. Now imagine that you're running make, or you're running a compiler, you know, command, and what you get is actually like a huge amount of output, not this little thing, just like a huge amount of output. And you might be thinking, oh, I want to see if like, there was an error in this header file for like, you know, stb image.h or like whatever. Any, any file, like, is that file in the warnings or in the errors? But it's like a huge thing. I like, scrolled off the screen. OK, so what would you do if you want to like, search for that keyword? What I do usually is I rerun the command, and I pipe it to grep. And I search for the keyword, right? And then I, I do get the results. Like, interesting. OK. Um, I don't love that. Um, can I do something different? And so take a look at this. Um, grep. I'm going to search for the keyword curl. I highlight the old output. Click, drag, and drop. And there's the result. And I can just once again add some color to it maybe, highlight, curl, the keyword. And there you go. So in this idea, you see how I'm highlighting that output. This idea is called output reuse. So I didn't have to rerun the command in order to search for the keyword that I was looking for because the terminal has this understanding now that you ran a command, there's some output, and you can talk about it in some hopefully intelligent way. All right, so here I am. I'm highlighting the old output. Uh, you can see there's a little like, file icon. That's really just the mouse because I just clicked on it. Now you understand why the project is called Terminal Click. 
you're going to be doing a lot of clicking. So click, and then drop it into grep, right? And then you do the search. So that's one of the first features. I'm just showing you a few nifty features from terminal click. Um, so that's one of them, output reuse. Want to see another one? Yeah. OK, I will show you another one. So this one's interesting. If, I don't know about you, but I'm often committing things to a version control system, you know, a repo. And so when, let's imagine we're using Git, you're using GitHub, and you do, okay, Git, commit, my project. Git will usually come and say, oh, uh, okay, you committed uh, 16 new lines of code, but you deleted 187. It's like, good, what's, what, but what's the net? You know, I'm, I'm thinking like, what's the net amount of code that I've added then? And so what I do is I leave the terminal, I find a calculator, I can't be bothered to do mental math, um, go to the calculator, do the thing, and then come back to the terminal, right? And that's just one example, but it happens often that I do need to do some arithmetic, which means I context switch away from the terminal, go to the calculator, come back to the terminal, right? Like, that's interesting. I, I don't love that. Uh, how can I make it so that I love it? Um, and as soon as I start typing some numbers in terminal click, it just recognizes that you're trying to do some arithmetic, right? So it has a, uh, a way to just give you a quick information, you know? This is just arithmetic, it's just a calculator. But it's built in to the terminal. And I already use this, so like, again, when I do my git commit, and I'm like, okay, 187 lines deleted, 60 lines added, calculator, right? There's the answer, and I, and I stayed within my workflow, if that makes sense, right? I just stayed bounded in the workflow, didn't have to move away from what I had to do. And this is like a, feels like a little thing, but these annoyances of context switching away from your terminal starts to build up. It starts to harm your workflow, in my view anyway. Okay? Hope you think calculator. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's show you one more. Okay. Um, one thing that also bothers me is that if I'm navigating the file system, how many of you, another question, please raise your hand if you genuinely use a terminal and then you're navigating from folder to folder and LSing and like displaying results. I wanna see if you're, <laughs> once again, almost unanimous, I get it, I get it. Um, so I was like, yeah, that seems like a lot of wasted time because it's like CD space and then the folder, and then, or maybe CD dot dot go back and then LS and then look and then go back to CD because that was the wrong one and then blah, 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 right? Lots of keystrokes spent on that. And once again, as I'm experimenting with how terminals can be improved, uh, I came up with the idea of, um, I just press uh, click, uh, control, or whatever, some key, and it goes into your working directory. So you can see the cursor went into your working directory, and now you can edit it in real time. And as you're editing it, you're just moving between files and folders. And you can even switch something like a PNG, like I'm doing right now, press enter, the PNG opens up, right? I guess some of you might want to see that maybe even in line inside the terminal. That could be done, right? Um, but it's the same idea. It's like I don't need to CD and LS all the time, right? I can just move the little cursor to where the working directory is and use the keyboard to navigate, right? Uh, so that's what we call, we have a built-in explorer on terminal click. And I use that all the time now. I can never CD and LS ever again. It's just, I can't go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in fact, I want to show you one more thing, if I'm able to move here and run it. Uh, can you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So let me just run Terminal Click live. Um, this is a little small. Don't worry, I will make it bigger. Um, so this is Terminal Click. Maybe, oops, that's, sorry. That's live debug. Uh, Maybe make the, this a little bigger, maybe 20, 26, a little more. 100. No, <laughs> 28, 30. Okay, we'll just stop there. Um, but this is something that wasn't in the clip that you just saw. But again, if I need to do something basic, which is like I want to see, I want to go backwards and see the contents of the folder before me, right? What would you do? C, D, space, dot, dot, right? and then LS and press enter. How many keystrokes is that, people? Like uh, seven or? Right? It's a, well, yeah, sure. There's a lot of uh, keystrokes, and even with CD dash, like all you have to do right now is I press a key, 
I'm using control, but it could be any key, right? You could probably remap this. I'm just gonna press a key. And as soon as I press a key, I can see the contents of the folder, right? So it's not even like ls enter, which is like three keystrokes. No, it's just one, right? And let go. Now let's go backwards, right? So if I wanna cd dot dot um, and press enter, instead I just do control backwards and I'm already a folder back, right? Now let's say I'm like, ooh, wrong, I didn't wanna be in that folder. Let me, how do I like uh, undo what I just did? Well, I'm still holding control, right? So Z and I'm back, right? Or just like go as backwards as you want and then Z, Z, Z to go back if you need to, right? So the idea is here that you're not spending time CD and LSing anymore, right? And you can see live what's going on. And then once you, once you find something that interests you, you know, uh, you can let go of control and now I'm, I'm in the projects folder. Control, go backwards, and let go, I'm on the Abner folder, right? So that's the idea, that's the idea. It's to save a lot of time. This really does save you a lot of time. You no longer have to, um, this, is, this is technically a context switch too, right? Because your workflow is I just need to access some files for my work and now I have to think about CD and LSing and returning with all these primitive constructs, right? No, there's no need for that. Um, just do control, move your cursor up to the working directory and play around with it, right? Cool. Uh, let's go back to demo. Sweet. Um, <laughs> am I allowed to, uh, okay. somebody? Okay. <laughs> I got you, I got you. What's going on here? Oh, I think this is the last feature. This is the last feature I wanna show you. I'm running a bunch of commands. And you know when you have to do history, like you need to go back and see your history? Here it is, here's your history. It's the command with the associated output. <laughs> Thank you. And I had this feature as, as early as, you know, when I started seriously with this terminal, it was 2020. You can see that this feature was already available as soon as 2020. That's why you can see the timestamps too, right? So commands, output, and timestamp, right? And that to me has also been a bit of a game changer. So. The idea of an enhanced history. Uh, with your terminal right now, day to day, if you want to have a history, uh, like previous commands, yeah, you can, you can press the up key. And it's just a command name, though. It's not associated with anything. But how many times have you thought, oh man, what was the result of that clang output or that zig output yesterday at 2 p.m.? It's like, I just, what was it? Right now, you, well, you have to do one of two things. Number one is that, um, you try to recreate the scenario by just running the command in a certain way with the specific command and like look at that output and see what happened. Or you, somehow you had the foresight to run the command re and redirect it to some text file, right, using the shell, and then try to see if that works. Um, there's no need for that if your terminal just understands the nature of your command, that it has some output, that it has a timestamp, bundle it up together, give that to the user, make that natively accessible, it's a bit of a superpower if your terminal can manage to do that, right? So enhanced history, I, I think I'm gonna stop here in terms of features. This is just like a, a, a platter sample, right? Of some of the things, um, I don't know if you agree or not, but I, to me, I'm loving this more than being thrown back into older terminals, right? I'm not saying it's a fully featured terminal, we'll talk about that, this is an experiment, but it's far, far along enough that I feel comfortable, you know, giving a talk about it. And um, another thing you might have noticed is uh, it is cross-platform. So the videos that you saw were from Linux. But then when I was showing you the demo, it's from Mac, right? And I, I don't have my Windows machine with me, but it does also work on Windows, right? And you can see that I'm running like a ping command localhost and like highlighting the output because of the output reuse feature, right? Um, this, uh, it works on Windows, trust me, bro. You know? Uh, <laughs> Um, and it is native too, so it, we'll talk about that. It's native and it's cross-platform, right? Okay, uh, I think it's important to talk about the motivation, right? And then we'll, this, this is particularly gonna be um, like two oceans in this talk. The first ocean, I'm gonna like dive you into this ocean with me and, and explain uh, the motivation of this, see if people are inspired in the same way that I've been inspired, and then we'll go, go out of the ocean 
enter another ocean of like how it works, right? So the first one we just talked about, it's like we've been working on terminals for years and years and years, and we're just confused as to why they've never changed, right? So the first motivation is more like, why hasn't it ever changed? I'm just, I'm confused. So uh, I do some research. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. So it looks like they're complicated <laughs> beasts. Something that looks so simple is actually deceptively, you know, a monster. Um, uh, have you guys heard of X Xterm, probably? It's a very famous terminal on Linux. And when I opened up the source code, the opening comment is, abandon hope. <laughs> All ye who enter here. And that's enough to scare anybody. So I'm, I'm not surprised that people just don't want to mess with terminals when you see something like that. So they, they seem like complicated beasts and complex monsters and like people, the authors themselves go like, don't come, don't come. <laughs> uh, so interesting. Another reason, I think, is that it's a burden, it's a maintenance burden to write a terminal because there's so much legacy programs that rely on specific ways that terminals behave, right? So we've been writing terminal programs since like the 70s or the 80s or something like that. So we have decades worth of programs that expect terminals to behave a certain way. And if you change things around, you've broken the programs of so many people across decades that the maintenance burden of that just sounds horrifying. It's like, maybe I shouldn't touch it either because it's just, it's just difficult. And I, you know, Apple doesn't touch it, right? Windows doesn't really touch it, right? We do have, maybe, I do have a couple of competitors here and there that I do think are touching it now, which is exciting, right? But otherwise, it's just it's something we don't, we don't really do. Um, and the last reason, so there's actually three reasons. So the last reason of why terminals are on change, in my opinion, is that the terminology of terminals are all over the place. Right, when somebody talks about a terminal, they might be actually talking about the shell, or bash, or they're actually talking about what, what's called a PTY device driver pair, or a pseudo terminal, or the actual emulator, which is what you see. Right? So terminal is actually not a terminal. It's, a terminal is many things that we just happen to call terminal, but then when you actually get to the specific terminology of it, and it's so coupled to the Linux kernel, and you're like, okay. We, can, don't, we don't even have a common, common language to talk about terminals. How can we ever expect to be productive in changing it, right? So that's the first reason that I realized. I'm motivated uh, to understand why they weren't changing, and now I know why they're not changing. Okay, okay, I know what I'm getting into. <laughs> um, the second motivation is to avoid context switching. And I think the features that I just showed you just really highlights that, right? I don't wanna leave the terminal if I'm working on the terminal, right? So I want my calculator to be right there, I want my file explorer to be right there. <laughs> um, and I don't want to switch away to using the shell uh, in these arcane ways. The shell can be useful, we'll talk about that later, but like, uh, if I can just have the terminal be a little smarter about what it is that it's running, right, and like interact with it in a way that's not just dead text, your workflow can be preserved in very interesting ways. So avoid context switching was the second motivation. Um, and there's probably way more ways to, to avoid context switching that I still haven't even figured out, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that, right? And the last, uh, motivation piece is that I want to motivate, I am motivated to motivate others because the landscape of terminals is barren, right? Like there's barely anybody really seriously taking, t taking terminals seriously. And again, I, we understand why, but it's not, once you see what I've done or, or like how this works, you might either be extremely horrified that I have built terminal click this way <laughs> and you're like, Abner, that's not the right way to build a terminal. I can't believe you're, right? Right? Or you might be inspired and be like, oh, interesting. So that's how you manage to sidestep all of the complications. <laughs> and it's like, I'm motivated too, so I'll do something like that too. So we'll see in which camp you fall into. Right? Come talk to me after the, the talk and you can either berate me or uh, be happy with me. Right? So <laughs> how it all works. This is the meat, this is the meat of the talk. Right? Um, uh, you might be horrified just because it's in vanilla C in the first place. Right? Um, <laughs> People are like, what about Zig? What about Odin? What about even just C++, man? Like, why are you doing C, right? Um, and really the reason is that I grew up with C and uh, my first program was a terminal program in C. And it's the thing I'm most comfortable with. So it's a little bit of an homage. It's like homage to C. And also, um, I don't think I'll see you see forever. So like future projects, I'm very interested in Zig, this conference. Uh, I've talked about Zig, and I use Zig for this project too. It's just not the main, the, the core code base. So we'll talk about that. But and anyway, see these days, it's not as horrible as you might think, right? <laughs> uh, like, Amir, why aren't you running with scissors though? Like, 
no, I don't think so. So first of all, I have what I believe is a solid memory strategy, right? And, uh, you know, we, there's this term a friend of mine does, ha has. A friend of mine who's gonna be at the conference that I'm running, I would love to insert a little bit of marketing with you because it's an indie conference, it's just me and the little guy. I feel like it's fair game to talk about my conference a little bit, right? Um, right? So this will be a talk in Handmade Boston, right? Uh, if you're watching this online, then maybe you can Google Handmade Boston. You might be able to find this recording at that time, right? Um, and my friend Ryan here has learned how to write C programs in a way that effectively, effectively, I'm not saying officially, or, you know, or like thoroughly, but it effectively reduces your memory bugs down to zero, or your common memory bugs are eliminated. And it's this idea of like, you gotta burn down the forest of malux and freeze in your code base, man. Right? So if you look at the C programs, they, you know, when people today complain about C programs, what they're complaining about is the way we've written C programs, especially like early days, you know, 80s, 90s, like whenever it became most popular. Um, Malics are fruits are everywhere. You need, you need to allocate a little bit of a resource, uh, like a struct that needs to live across lifetimes of functions. Malloc everything. Malloc all the objects, right? And you gotta individually be responsible across the entire rat's nest of your code base to free those malocs, right? Um, and then we're saying, no, 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 burn down that entire forest, right? Call malloc maybe perhaps only once at the beginning, right? Like a large enough chunk. This is almost like a, we're aware in Handmade because we, at Handmade we love to dive deep into how things work and as software you can love definitely to a reasonable degree. We love to dive into deep into how things work. Modern operating systems right now have a thing called virtual memory, right? And it's a system that the kernel gives you that lets you page in physical page, you know, memory in and out with the memory management unit. It's like, oh, okay, so there's all this fancy stuff where I can technically write a program that asks the operating system, give me like 30 gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> or something, right? And like technically, you're not, getting, you're not gonna get the entire 30 gigabytes. What's happening is that you can say you reserve that space, and then as you need it, then you can just like bring those pages in. All I'm trying to say is that you can upfront how much memory you think you need, uh, and then slice it around as needed. Like this is memory strategies for this, is what I'm trying to say. So I won't go too, de too deep into it. Hopefully, this is something you can look at later. There's also, uh, maybe uh, uh, later we can talk about their blog post about this. There is a strategy here for you to avoid the forest of Maddox and Freeze. And effectively, I don't have memory problems in C anymore. All right? Um, <laughs> and, you know, C has gotten good in terms of the spec. C23, I don't think it's out yet officially in compilers, but I'm excited about it. I'm just trying to say that C is still alive and kicking, and we're still doing improvements to it. And uh, even if you have something like Clang, Right? We have a thing called extensions that lets you avoid all of the pitfalls of old C, right? You can tell Clang, I wanna avoid having to default through on a switch. I need, I need you to tell me a warning about this and that. Like, it has gotten better. So again, the real reason I'm using C is because I grew up with it <laughs> and I'm most comfortable with it. But I'm also telling you, if you have to write C today, we do have solid memory strategies, compilers and extensions and specifications and a committee that is still keeping it kind of like keeping up with the Joneses almost, right? It'll never really be the Joneses, <laughs> but it's keeping up, right? Um, okay, so let's talk about the windowing and graphics here. Um, again, we're talking about how it all works, right? Windowing and graphics. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Soko, but this is just a library, and it's a very simple library in the sense that it's just also vanilla C code, and it's something you can include in a header file. It's a single header file and it abstracts away all the modern APIs of graphics. So we're talking uh, Vulkan, or not, uh, OpenGL specifically, Metal, DirectX, all of these things, and it abstracts it with a common set of C functions that if you know how to call them, like prepare this thing and then render the triangles or like render the sprites and all of that stuff, uh, and you compile that library in C, it'll automatically compile down to the corresponding Metal code, the corresponding uh, direct X code, the corresponding OpenGL code, et cetera, depending on which platform you're in. So in other words, I have a unified interface, let's say, in just vanilla C using this library to talk about how to render graphics. And then when I compile it, it'll compile down depending on which operating system you're on to the right modern graphics API, right? So I'm only in on Soko because I love that system, right? And it's not just Soko, like they also provide Soko app, 
which is the same thing. It'll just come instead of C functions, but it'll compile down to the right windowing window functions, right? So I just outsource this problem to this thing. And what I love about it is like it's a small library. It's really small. I can read it. I can modify it, right? Um, same thing with the UI system, right? I'm using this library also called micro UI. You can Google these things. So you can Google Soco Graphics. You can Google micro UI. You can see that this is just like 2,000 lines of C code to represent an entire system for you to render UI elements, right? It's not feature complete. It's just the very bare essence. But I just, this is a terminal, right? I don't have to have more than that. Micro UI does the job for me, right? Then the next question is, you know, okay, it's cross-platform, but really how? Because Linux and Mac terminals don't work the same way that Windows terminals work. So Windows terminals behave historically very differently from a terminal in Linux and from a terminal in Mac. At the very least, Mac and Linux are Unix, right? And, and they share the same infrastructure and protocol when you're a terminal author writing a terminal. They share the same infrastructure and protocol for you to write a terminal. But Windows is alien to that system. And so how do you make that cross-platform? Uh, for the longest time, we really didn't have a good answer for that, actually. And it wasn't until some team on Windows, I don't know how this happened, but I'm grateful. Um, in 2018, they released this API called ConPTY. Uh, don't worry about the acronyms right now, it doesn't matter. The idea is, that it's, as you can see, infrastructure. It's the same infrastructure now. Uh, the setup to get to this API will be different than Windows and Mac. But once the setup is complete, like you write the right boilerplate code, now you can have the same protocol and infrastructure as Mac and Linux. So this is now this unified, once again, interface. And it's great for a terminal author. Before ConPTY, writing a third-party terminal on Windows was a nightmare, almost impossible. You would have to scrape the output from a console API. It's, it's just not, it wasn't good. But now we have a good way. And I definitely like, uh, use this a lot in order to make terminal click work on Windows. Okay? So you can also Google that. It's an interesting uh, feature. That's what helps you write Windows in the same way you can write terminals on the other platforms. Right? Okay? Speaking of platforms, I want to make a comment since we're talking about how it all works. Um, I have what's called a platform layer, and that's just, once again, um, if you're writing something on Windows, Windows has a Win32 API and a set of ways in which you can write a program, and it's different from Mac and Linux. But they turn to be the same behavior, right? All you need is to open up a window, or you need to play some sound, or you need to render some graphics. So why is the language so different across operating systems. So when you want, you want the same behavior of like opening a window, rendering some text, pressing X, right? Um, what I do is I uh, do this idea of a platform layer. It handmade popularized it, as far as I can tell, where it's, again, you organize your code in a certain way such that like, you can have a function called OS open window, for example. But then when you compile it inside that implementation function, you can detect which operating system you're in, and then you implement that version inside that function, depending on which operating system. So it's like shenanigans with the compiler and the build system such that your OS uh, open window function is all you have to think about, no matter if you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux, but then when you compile OS open window, it'll choose the right implementation depending on which operating system you're in, right? So like I have all these OS underscore do something functions, again, in vanilla C. And then that's all I have to think about when I'm writing the terminal, just like these OS functions. I don't have to think about if I'm on Windows or Mac or Linux anymore because I front-loaded that concern by designing those OS underscore something functions and then making sure that they do the right thing depending on which operating system. So you front-load those concerns ahead of time so that when you're actually working on the terminal, you avoid having to think about which operating system you're in. Uh, and it's never that perfect in the real world. Like sometimes you have to like, oh, this isn't supported in this operating system, so what, I, what do I do, right? But on the whole, it saves you a lot of time if you do that. And I was inspired by uh, also a good friend, Alan Webster, who is the one showing us how to build platform layers. So if you're writing a vanilla C program, and I think this might even work for other languages, you know, like Zig or Odin, like you can think about uh, platform layers in an interesting way. So maybe check that out if, if you're curious about that system. Right? And then, finally, how do I actually build it? This is where Zig comes in. It's so exciting. So, um, Zig is a C compiler, you could say. Right? Zig is a programming language, but it's also a C compiler. And it's also a drop-in C and C++ compiler. So if I just download a Zig binary 
no matter which operating system I'm on, I have a C compiler or C++ compiler working. Like, I don't have to install MSVC on Windows. Right? It's like, what a joy, right? <laughs> like, oh my god. <laughs> um, so I, I, I definitely learned how it is. This is specifically for version 0.10. I'm sure certain things might change across newer versions, but the idea is the same, right? Um, so I'm just saying, terminal click. Uh, the, the very beginning is almost like boilerplate-y in the sense that you can just learn how it, how it is that you want to describe in Zig, in Zig code, how you want to build your C program. I was like, this is wild. I can, in Zig code, describe how to build my program in C. And so I'm doing it, right? And you can see sort of here, these are the flags of Clang <laughs> or GCC. So I'm like, I, I created three variables. If I'm on Windows, these are the flags I want. Right? You can, for example, see SoCo. I'm saying if I'm on Windows, SoCo, you need to compile down my graphics functions to Direct3D. If I'm on Mac, SoCo, you need to compile down your graphics functions to Metal. <laughs> uh, same thing with Linux for uh, OpenGL in this case. Right? And everything else, like C11 right now, and whatever. This is just Clang, but being described in SIG. And you can see that at the very bottom of that uh, file, or screenshot, I'm like C arguments, undefined. But I can also ask Zig, <laughs> in Zig, am I on Windows? <laughs> okay, then use the Windows arguments for the compiler. Am I on Mac? Use the, Windows, use the Mac arguments for the compiler. Am I on Linux, right? Uh, if, if it's something else, then uh -uh, <laughs> go away, right? Um, and then I add in main.c, that pulls in the entire code base. I can even say, please link libc for me. I need the C runtime right now. I love that so much, right? And then also you need to link stuff. You can ask Zig, please, if I'm on Windows, link against the kernel 32 and GDI and, D and DirectX. If I'm on Mac, same thing. Metal, I need Cocoa, I need Quartz, not a problem. If I'm on Linux, I need, I need X11, unfortunately, and XI and XCursor, et cetera, right? <laughs> and if not, I'll support the operating system. You're compiling terminal click in something I'm not supporting, right? So that's just, that's just fantastic. And then you end it by installing, you know, the EXE. And again, in my view, this is like boilerplate things just to finish things off, right? That's how I see it. Um, so hopefully that, I, I call Zig build. If I'm on Windows, I get clone, I clone my terminal click repository, Zig's there, call Zig build, I have, a, I have a native terminal working. I clone the repo on Mac, same idea. Call Zig build, I have the terminal working. I do it on, Win, on Linux, same thing, right? Okay, and we're now into the last section of the talk, which I think, is, uh, <laughs> you might be asking Abner, what about the actual fancy shenanigans that you've done? You know, the output reuse, the calculator, <laughs> all these things. Uh, you haven't talked about that really. You just told us that you wrote something in C <laughs> and that you use Zig to build the C thing and that you use some libraries. <laughs> so like, what about the fancy shenanigans? So we're gonna end with the talk with this section right here. This is the second ocean, let's go. You know, this is the beating heart of terminal click, right? At the heart of things. So, um, what happens with terminals is they've been around a long time. So again, since the 70s and 80s. And you've got to wonder, like, how did terminals come to be? And in the past, terminals were just these dumb screen devices, you know? Um, back then, you didn't really have a computer. You just had a dumb terminal screen device like that. And then that's not a fruitsy, tootie roll. Uh, I'm sorry, like, I don't know what you call that twisty thing. This is a, this is a cable, <laughs> like a serial cable, okay? So you have your DOM terminal screen, you have a serial cable that connects to this gigantic mainframe. So that's how we did things in the old days, you know? Um, that's how things worked. Um, and what happened was, maybe uh, go a little back real quick. Um, so if somebody's writing a program, you're a programmer for this mainframe, and you're in a school, you're like an IT programmer person, and you're supposed to give this user who's in this terminal like a list of the students and grades and records, something like that. You're programming something for, your, for the professors, right? So you're writing that program for the mainframe, right? And the mainframe has to send that data to the terminal screen. So what you would do is you would, and by the way, the only method of communication between the screen and the mainframe is this little cable. It was like an RS-232 serial bit thing. It's just like bits, you know, and, and like single bytes. It's like one channel of information, really narrow. So it's like, wow, okay. So I can do, you can, this isn't exact, exactly accurate, but sure, printf, 
right? So I'm gonna print F the student records or something like that. But this terminal screen supports fancy things. Even though it's kind of dumb, it does support like color, and it supports flashing, and just all these interesting, cute little things. I'm like, oh, okay, so maybe I want to highlight in red that somebody got an F <laughs> in the class. So uh, print F, uh, huh. Okay, so the terminal is actually expecting as it's parsing the bytes from the, you know, from the cable. It's like, oh, if I get like a specific NC escape code, a specific notice that I am no longer printing text on the screen, I'm supposed to change my behavior. I'm supposed to render things in red now, right? You could do that. So basically you add what's called an NC escape code with a number that says, number, so to speak, uh, that says, I want you to render in red now, from now on and then characters that come in later are now being rendered in red. So it's like what's called in-band signaling. It just means that the control code information, the in instructions to control the screen are in the same channel as the characters you're supposed to render to the screen. It's all in one single line, so to speak, okay? Um, and that's important because this is how today you print F this way just because of how terminals worked back in the 70s, right? So for example, print F, there's the NC escape code, right? So your mainframe computer runs, the, you know, the program is running, it sends down those bytes down the cable to the terminal screen. The terminal device, the dumb screen, reads that NC escape code. Oh, you're telling me, I see this. This is, the escape is, you know, whatever, 033. Okay, what's the code? Oh, red, okay, I'm supposed to print characters in red from now on. Okay, I'm ready for the next set of bytes. So printf comes in, hello. Print in red, perfect, and then you're done. As a programmer, you're like, yeah, I'm done printing in red. You signal once again with a new NC escape code. Again, control information in that same string. Reset. And then from now on, anything that gets rendered goes back to normal. It's no longer red. I hope that makes reasonable uh, sense. Great. That's important to know. Uh, as you can see, you know, there's a DOM terminal, there's the cable, there's the mainframe. Excellent. All right. Uh, these days, computers don't work that way. Uh, but all of this has been emulated to perfection on your machine. So on your machine, all of these three components, when we really talk about a terminal, we're talking about these three things living on your laptop, right? So instead of a dumb terminal device, what you actually have is what's called a terminal emulator. Right? So I'm helping you on, on a, like, disentangle the terminology here, okay? So the emulator is what you actually see. When you saw my screenshots, when you saw me playing with the live demo, that's the emulator, that's the graphics application. You can write that in C++ and SDL, I don't care, that's your graphics application, that's the emulator. Then you have what I call the Linux pipe. That's how you emulate the cable. It's not exactly a pipe, that's why I'm doing this. It's, more, it's a more tr specific terminology for it, like pseudo terminal, whatever. It's okay, let's call it a pipe for this talk. Not a problem, you have a Linux pipe or a Mac pipe, I don't care. Right? And then instead of a mainframe, what you have is a bunch of binaries living on your user bin or on your path, all of these things. So the mainframe has been replaced with just a set of binaries living on your file system. Right? Uh, so that's the idea. When you run Clang or Zig or any program, you're typing it in the emulator, it goes through the pipe, and your, uh, the mainframe right, finds Clang and then reports back to you. So it's all being emulated. This is what we call an emulator. It's just emulating the things of the past. So old programs can still run when, Vim, I think Vim was written in what, 19, it was definitely like in the 80s. Maybe the first version of Vim was like 1976, right? Um, so this is why we keep things as they are, emulated as they are, so old programs don't break, right? And I kind of lied, there's an extra component to this system, right? It's what we call bash. And I wonder if, um, let me see. I'm sorry, guys. Nah, okay. So with Bash, this is like a manager because if you're running something like Clang or Vim, right, and you're like, oh, I need to pause and run something else, right? Don't you want to be able to return to the old thing? So the idea here is that uh, with Bash, it's a manager almost that says, okay, you, you do control Z or control Z or something like that. Okay, I'm gonna take care of, you're giving me a signal to pause, go back, and then uh, run another program. I can do that for you. So it's this fancy manager that's managing all those binaries and processes for you, right? 
So it's a, that's a new thing. And it's a, it's a program that can be written in C or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so if you have a keyboard, that's the wrong keyboard. Let's try that again. Um, if you have a keyboard and you type something like zig, right, because you're going to run zig on your terminal, this is what's actually happening. What your emulator is doing is it's passing along the letter Z and I and G, and when you press enter, all that's being passed along to this shell, to the separate program that will then connect, the, find and connect the right program for you to the pipe, and then now you can run things, right? This is all happening in your laptop as soon as you run Zig. It's being passed along. Now, there's a problem here, and this is where uh, I'm at the heart of terminal click. This is the te so I spent all this time diving deep into how things work just to be able to see where I can make a change. I'm like, I can make a change here, right? Because the terminal emulator is just passing along characters without any understanding of user input. Just zero understanding of user input. It's, just, it's the shell that knows things. But the shell is disconnected from the emulator. It has no access to the graphics API. It has no access to nothing. It's just a process that is only text only. Right? Back and forth. This is why we get dead text up until today. It's because the terminal emulator, the graphics program, has no idea what it is you're typing. It's just going character by character, passing it along to the pipe. And I said, um, how about we go crazy? Right? This might be unorthodox. But this is, again, the heart of terminal click. I say, let's, let's get rid of bash for now. It's not that I hate shells. Shells can come back. But right now, no bash. <laughs> Just don't do bash. Just don't do that. So now we just have an emulator. <laughs> you have your graphics program. You're writing something in vanilla C like me. I don't care, in Zig, I don't care. You have your emulator. Somebody type Zig now. I'm not gonna pass along those characters down the pipe. There's no pipe right now. In other words, your terminal is building up an understanding. It's buffering user input. It's understanding what it is you're writing. Oh, you're writing Zig. That's a, okay, is that on the path? Sure, there's Zig. Okay, cool, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a note of that. Like I might be writing on my, uh, my terminal author, like, let's, let's make a struct. Zig, this happened, here's the timestamp, all of these things, right? And I don't even, I just start up the pipe myself, create a Linux pipe, find Zig right away, <laughs> connect it right away, there's no bash, um, and get it done. And what's interesting about that is that after you're done running Zig, right, because the terminal understood beforehand what it is you're trying to run, I'm not just passing along characters in a dumb way, I'm just I'm buffering understanding, like you wrote, you know, um, I, somebody ran Zig, I remember the output. I have a timestamp for when it happened, I'll tell you how long it ran for. I'll know if it failed or not, ask me anything, <laughs> right? So now your terminal emulator, you know, has an understanding of user input and now we can when you move your mouse to the old output, the terminal goes like, okay, I understand that you're hovering on this coordinate right here. From this, oh, this output is from Zig from two hours ago because I have that in a struct somewhere. So let me just render like a little block so you can, I can tell you that it is interactive. What do you want to do with it, <laughs> right? That's the idea, okay? So for example, this, this is how output reuse works because I am letting the emulator assume in some way the responsibilities of the shell. And that's the key idea behind terminal click. I'm letting the emulator on the local side, emulator side, assume the responsibilities of the shell more. It's not that the shell can't have a place. It's just that for now, as I'm experimenting, let's get rid of the shell and think about what the emulator can do for us, right? And definitely more is possible. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna like truly go about possibilities, but hopefully you can think about that. Okay? If your emulator has now structured user input, right, with access to not just like the commands that are being run, and for how long they're being run, and the output that you're getting, right? You also have the graphics API right there too. So like, there's this interesting combination. Like, I can imagine me writing like a little Mario animation that's running while you're expecting Clang to finish, <laughs> or something like that. Or if you're onboarding junior employees at your company, you can just give them like little buttons that they can just click on, and instead of a bash script, it's just visual things that are coupled with commands, and then you get visual feedback on it. You know, that's the idea. But, <laughs> I'll end with this. We are breaking a lot of stuff, <laughs> right? 
Uh, many of you probably use Bash a lot, and you have a whole environment with environment variables and <laughs> Bash scripts that really, you know, uh, so you might, okay. Um, this doesn't work over SSH either, right? Because this, all these features are local to the emulator, right? So it's not gonna work over the network, right? So it's just local to the emulator. Bash doesn't work, like what's going on, right? So that's the scary part. I would like to hear your thoughts on it, <laughs> because do you see all the potential, but then like, what are we losing? And in my opinion, though, um, I hope to motivate others, this is my concluding note, is that I hope I can motivate you to think about, it's, it's okay if it's complicated like X term, but I don't have to follow those paths, right? I, I don't have to be backwards compatible with everything. I can anger people if I don't support SSH. I can anger people if I don't support Bash. Because my workflow is very often just running compiler commands, right? And looking at history and using Git, I'm not on SSH all the time, all of these things, so like, I feel like I can survive with just these features breaking everything else. Others might not, right? And maybe there are ideas to make this work in ways that are compatible with shell and like all everything. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, and then I'll finish, I'll finish by giving you a blatant marketing number. Like, Amner, I wanna try terminal click, right? So what's gonna happen is in August, this is where the next, my conference is gonna be happening in August. Uh, for those who are watching online, please wait a second. <laughs> But here in person, um, if you're watching this online, in August, uh, when the conference, my conference starts, I will be giving everybody who attended Software You Can Love here a free copy of Terminal Click. And you guys can play around with it and tell me what you think of it. Right? So I'm asking you for giving me a couple of months. Right? So my next conference in a couple of months. Um, if you bring somebody to attend my conference, <laughs> uh, they will also get a free copy of uh, Terminal Click, and I think it'll be fine. Anybody who attends, actually, Handmade Boston 2023 will get a copy of Terminal Click, and uh, I hope that was okay to do that little bit of Oh, ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then in early 2024, I'll release it to the public, right? But for August, for the rest of the year, I just want your input. I want you to try it out. I want you to tell me what you hate about it. I want you to tell me what's broken about it. I want you to tell me what you love about it, or give me ideas. So starting with you guys, right? So right away in August, you get a copy, and then anybody who attends Boston will then be the second uh, wave, they'll get a copy, et cetera, right? Um, and then next year we'll release it to the public. So that's the idea. That's Terminal Click for you. I hope that was insightful in some way. Uh, that's the website for it too. It really just redirects the conferences right now. But I'll have a proper website for it. It's just, my life is like half organizer, half programmer, so it's all, it's all a blur for me. But thank you so much. I, uh, it's, uh, Okay, I think we're ready. So, here's the camera. Hello. Okay, uh, Abner is about to speak. Abner, tell me something about, okay, give me one reason. Vancouver is very nice. Give me one reason to go to a city in the United States. Let's say Seattle. Why should I go to Seattle? What should you do in Seattle? Well, why should I go to Seattle? We are super into nature. So okay. we have lots of parks basically any block away. Uh, you mm -hmm. can enjoy like sceneries, like where I live in Seattle specifically, it's like this apartment building that if I just walk a couple of blocks, there's a park. Or okay. if I walk five more minutes, there's Green Lake. Right? Understood. What, what if I'm more into like, I don't know, social events like conferences? <laughs> well, you're talking to an organizer <laughs> for conferences in Seattle. So you could come to mine if I can plug that in. So. Can you tell me more about this? Yes. So the conference in Seattle is called Handmade Seattle. And uh, it's not the only one, so I do other conferences now starting like in another city. So you, you will go to Handmade Cities, mm -hmm. handmadecities.com, all smooshed together, handmadecities.com, click on Seattle, and then you can see what we're up to. We're a bunch of nerds and programmers who love software, who love building software, and it's a lot of fun. Like we have hundreds of people attend, and it's not just programming. We also organize lots of informal hangouts, right? We go to the Mopop Museum, uh, we explore the city together, it's great. Okay, nice. Okay, so Seattle, that, uh, that sounds interesting. Maybe, you know, the, the West Coast, a little bit too far. Can you, is there a city on the East Coast that, or nearby that you would recommend? Yes, I mean, once again, I will be recommending the conference that happens that I'm organizing. <laughs> That's, <laughs> uh, it's in Boston, right? <laughs> so Boston's a great city also to, to explore and do some of the same things we're doing in Seattle, just in the East Coast. So that will be my other recommendation. Nice. Does Boston have public transport? Yeah. 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 I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.
so much. <laughs>